Welcome to this edition of Zanktus, I'm sorry, George Smeaton on the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Omnipotent God, who sees that we put not our trust in anything that we do, mercifully grant that by thy omnipotent power we may be defended against all adversity through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, and Professor Smeaton has been walking us through the Bible from the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, to David, to the prophets, to the Gospels, and now we are in St. Paul. And out of the apostles do we find so many allusions, as is supplied in the epistles of Paul, to the Spirit's work in the full extent of his saving and sanctifying operations. Besides other reasons which might be mentioned, this may be ascribed to the fact that Paul had not known Christ after the flesh, 2 Corinthians 5.16, and received his revelations more in the way of inward communication by the Spirit than by outward intercourse with his Lord, though he also received the latter. And accordingly, in the memorable passage where he says, now the Lord is that spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.17. The close connection in which he places Christ in the spirit shows how fully he apprehended their joint mission and how emphatically he intimates that Christ is never to be conceived of as apart from the spirit, nor the spirit conceived of as apart from him. To the impartial inquirer who only seeks the truth, the apostle Paul conveys with sufficient evidence a testimony to the divine dignity of the spirit when we find him saying in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit spoke by the prophet Isaiah, Acts 28 and 25, that the Spirit testified from city to city at bonds and in prison that awaited him, 20 verse 23, when he declares that the Holy Ghost sustained him in ministry, Romans 15, 19 when he appeals to the Holy Ghost and calls him to witness, Romans 9, verse 1. When he uses the same expression sent forth, ex to describe the mission of the Spirit that he employed to describe the mission of the Son, Galatians 4, 4 through 6. But we shall, as we proceed, see other proofs that come to expression. When we survey the names or titles of the Spirit in Paul's epistles, they are numerous. Thus he is called the Spirit of God, Romans 8, 9. The Spirit of his Son, Galatians 4, 6. The Spirit of Christ, Romans 8, 9. The Spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead. If we look at the economy in virtue of which the Spirit is sent, he is said to be shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. If we survey his titles as derived from the benefits and blessings which he confers, of which he is the immediate author, he is called the Spirit that dwelleth in us, the Spirit of grace the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, Ephesians 4, 17. The spirit of adoption, Romans 8, 15. The spirit of life, Romans 8, 2. The spirit of meekness, Galatians 6, 1. The spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 7. 
the commencement of the Christian life as contrasted with the previous sinful life is uniformly ascribed by the apostle to the Holy Ghost. Thus he says, no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. And again, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. Oh, hello, Proverbs 9, 10. Good to, good to have you here. I'll have to look up Proverbs 9.10 later. Um, back to the Holy Spirit. Whether we refer this expression, the laver, or the wash basin of regeneration to baptism or not, certainly the last term, the renewing of the Holy Ghost, must be construed as referring to the active operation of the Spirit at the commencement of Christian life. As it is the shedding or pouring out of the spirit, the Greek word is ex ekein, to which salvation is traced. This cannot be referred to mere doctrine. The personal spirit is mentioned as the producing cause. If it is asked in what sense can men be said to be saved by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. When the salvation is in Christ, the answer is obvious. There is a series of truths of which no link can be wanting. We are saved by the divine purpose and counsel of God. For God hath chosen us to salvation. We are saved by the atonement as the meritorious ground of all. We are saved by faith as the bond of union to Christ. We are saved by grace as contrasted with works which we do. We are saved by the truth as conveying God's testimony. And we are saved at, as, as it is here expressed by the renewing of the Holy Ghost as producing faith in the heart. This special work of the spirit in conversion is thus proved to be essentially necessary, essentially indispensable as any other link in the chain of salvific operations. The apostle further speaks of saving blessings which the human eye has not seen, nor the human ear hath heard, but is revealed to us inwardly by the omnipotent spirit. And he adds that we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is out of and from God, so that we may know the things that are freely and gratuitously given to us of God. When the spirit is called the spirit of faith, that is the author or the one producing the faith, 2 Corinthians 4.13. According to the uniform meaning of that formula, there can be no more conclusive proof that the commencement of new life must be ascribed to the Holy Spirit. There are three Pauline epistles which are full and definite in the elucidation of the doctrine of the Spirit. The two epistles to the Corinthians, the Galatians, and the Romans. I shall for first refer to their testimony, but by no means in a minute or exhaustive way. In the above mentioned order, one principal topic to be found in the epistles to the Corinthians has reference to the personality and the work of the spirit, the influence and operations, because they were counteracting his work by attaching undue importance to human wisdom and pluming and puffing themselves on the possession of various gifts 
which they owed absolutely to the spirit, but which were given for a different purpose. They dishonored the spirit by their self-complacency, emulation, and contentious partisanship, partly by their readiness to think lightly of the old licentious tendencies and feelings for which Corinth had been all too notorious. The Holy, by the Holy Spirit, the apostle did not mean, as some have thought, a mere title of God or of Christ. He meant and taught the personal Holy Ghost, distinct from the Father and the Son, a partaker of the same numerical divine nature. He referred to the Spirit sent forth on his mission as the guide and teacher of the church, whose fellowship as a divine person was invoked in the apostolic benediction in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, as the great gift of the Christian church. He reminded the Corinthians who were so favored with a supply of supernatural endowments as to come behind in no gift, that they were the temple of God and inhabited by the spirit. And then subjoins a warning against defiling it. In the most conclusive way, but without formal proof, the apostle introduces the personality and the omniscience of the Holy Ghost when he says, the spirit searches all things, yes the deep things of God, 1 Corinthians 2.10. He is thus referred to as personally distinct from God, for he searches the deep things of God, must be distinct in person, yet divine in essence. The same divine personality is brought out in connection with the rich profusion of extraordinary gifts with which the Christian church was endowed. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of administrations or ministries, but it is the same Lord. There are diversities, but it is the same God who worketh all in all. The spirit, the producer of the gifts, is thus distinguished from the gifts. But he is also distinct from God, the author of the operations, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the author of the ministries. The import is to the same effect as that which the apostle elsewhere expresses when he speaks of one God, the Father, and of one Lord Jesus Christ and one spirit who unites Christians in the closest bond of union. A personal will is ascribed to him. He divides his gifts to everyone severally as he will. To the subject of spiritual or miraculous gifts, which occupies a most important place in these epistles, I need not refer. After the elucidation given, except to say that they illustrate the peculiar economy of the Holy Spirit. Other passages not less clearly teach the special action of the Spirit in the whole application of redemption. To some of these we shall now allude. A. Such were some of you, the ear washed the ear sanctified, the ear justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. The three verbs, washed, sanctified, and justified, have such an affinity to each other that they all must be put in one category as referring to the absolution sacrificial acceptance and judicial justification of the Corinthians 
compared with their former state as one of guilt, exclusion from God's presence, and just condemnation. One and the same thing, says Calvin, is expressed by different terms. How far these Christians corresponded individually to their high calling, we forbear to inquire. But what we desire to place prominently before our mind is that these saving blessings are referred first to the name or merits of Christ as the procuring cause, and then to the Spirit of our God, who made the Corinthians partakers of them by his own effectual application. Plainly, this operation of the Spirit is distinguished from the preaching of the gospel. The latter may be and probably is included in the phrase, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which certainly intimates his merits and may take in the further thought of preaching his merits. But manifestly, something more than moral suasion is intimated as to the application of redemption. A power immeasurably greater, that is, the Spirit of our God, is referred to as enlightening their mind and leading them to embrace the great salvation and to be assured that they were washed, sanctified, and justified. B, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Here the apostle after noting the unsearchable riches of the glory of revelation and tracing it up to the spirit of God sets forth in the subsequent part of the chapter that the spiritual discernment and saving reception of it are not less from the spirit of God than revelation itself. As to the title natural man, it is not difficult to apprehend its meaning if we are content to interpret scripture by scripture without being encumbered by the language of philosophy. They are who are so called are simply those having the animal and rational elements without the spirit, Jude 19. The point of the expression, whether we suppose extreme depravity or not, James 3.15, is the privation or absence of the Spirit. And where this is, men do not receive the things of the Spirit, that is, the atonement and all the saving provisions of the gospel, and they cannot know them. I shall not efface the angles of this expression to make it less emphatic nor apologize for the expression being used for I am only an interpreter and with that my duty ends. The natural man is he who is not occupied by the supernatural power of the spirit. The phrase to receive the things of the spirit of God as applied to the word of truth is a common New Testament expression, meaning that through grace, the word is not only viewed as true, but assented to as God. Acts 17, 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 4, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. The word the natural man does not receive but when it is added, neither can he know them. Expositors and divines in general of the modern type transmute the words into will not to know them. Human and others adduce as corroborative proof for this sense. How could there do no mighty work because of their unbelief? 
Mark 6, 5 and 6. But it is a mistaken interpretation. The unbelief of Christ's townsmen at Nazareth was such that they neither brought their diseased and helpless friends to receive his miracles, nor came themselves to hear his wisdom, <coughs> thus limiting or curtailing his opportunity on conferring benefits. Or if we refer the words to the moral obstruction imposed by the unbelief itself, and suppose that Jesus, from a regard to the declarative glory of God, would not proceed to work miracles which were only to be met with scorn and rejection. There is little warrant for transmuting the apostles cannot know into will not to know. And we see this mitigation of total depravity in Bishop Ray Sutton's and Bishop Fenwick's declaration between the APA and the REC. Why the natural man receives, neither receives nor knows the things of the Spirit of God is next subjoined. The way of salvation by the cross, described as things of the Spirit of God, appears to him to be absurd, for they are foolishness to him. Though the propositions as such in which the doctrines are expressed can be sufficiently apprehended by the natural understanding, he receives them not, neither can he know them, without spiritual discernment, taste, or relish for them imparted by the Spirit of God. <clears throat> the Apostle makes no concealment of the malady and draws a broad distinction between one who has the Spirit and one who has not the Spirit. This C, this leads me to notice some of those significant expressions scattered over the epistles where the spirit receives express titles from the work which he performs in the application of redemption, especially this title, the spirit of faith. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Second Corinthians 4.13. The title spirit of faith intimates that the Holy Ghost is the author of faith. For all men have not faith, that it is not given to all and does not belong to all. Second Thessalonians 3.2. The designation means that the producing cause of faith is the Holy Spirit who produces this effect by that invincible call and invitation which accompanies according to the good pleasure of his will, the external proclamation of the gospel. The faith, therefore, of which he is the author is not affected by the hearer's own strength or by the hearer's own effectual will. John 6, 44, 45, Ephesians 2, 8, Philippians 1, 29. But it is also a fruit of Christ's merits. For apart from the merits of the Savior, no benefit can be conferred or can actually take effect upon condemned men. And though the mode in which the spirit produces faith cannot, in all its outlines, be fully comprehended by believers in this life, of one thing there can be, but no doubt, he takes out of the heart every hindrance and obstruction 
pleasantly persuades the judgment and gently binds the will. Nay, he works in us both to will and to do, or to put it into the words of Jesus. Everyone, therefore, that hath heard and learned of the Father comes unto me. The word of truth and the regenerating work of the Spirit are fully distinct, but always concurrent. The special operation of the Spirit inclines the sinner, previously disinclined, to receive the invitations of the gospel. Lord is he alone, acting as the spirit and giver of faith that removes the enmity of the carnal mind to those doctrines of the cross, which, but for this, would seem to be unnecessary or foolish and offensive. The apostle, in a profound passage in the second epistle to the Corinthians, delineates the difference between the Jewish and Christian economy as two different modes of administering one in the same covenant of grace. He contrasts the two in great points of antithesis between them. But what we have to consider here is their relation to the gift of the Holy Spirit. One important topic bearing on the difference of the two economies is the supply of the Spirit in the New Testament as contrasted with that of the Old. This is fully elucidated by the Apostle, 2 Corinthians 3, 6 18. The New Covenant contrasted with that of Sinai is called the ministration of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.8, because it was essentially a different economy. The new covenant is called the spirit, not the letter, because accompanied with the mission of the comforter and with the powerful operations of the spirit in a manner unknown before. Among its distinctive privileges, the supplies of the spirit which were of old promised by the prophets are conferred in a holy new way and with a copiousness not conferred before. The antithesis between the old and new covenant is expressed in a striking proposition, which is not without difficulty. The latter killeth and the spirit giveth light. This may be taken as a general proposition. And when so taken, it will be akin to the words, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. John 6, 63. If on the other hand, it refers to the difference of economies, which seems clearly to be the sign of the apostle. The meaning must be that the former left men without quickening spirit, or that the spirit of life was not dispensed by that economy. When it is said with special reference to the new covenant, the spirit giveth life, the import is that the spirit of life is now communicated in full and abundant measure. That is, Christ's words are spirit and life as compared with that shadowy dispensation which has passed away. A brief explanation will serve to remove the difficulty which expositors have found in the passage. Some have thought that the sinai covenant was simply a covenant of works, wholly different in character from the covenant of grace. That supposition cannot be accepted for the law is not against the promise of God, Galatians 3.17. The apostle very often speaks of a matter in a certain respect that is not absolutely, but in a certain respect, secundum quid. And the statement here made must be so understood. 
The Sinaitic covenant so far is founded on the law of rights and apart from the covenant of grace, which involved the promise of the spirit, was a killing letter, not only diverse from the new covenant, but leaving men in a state of bondage and debt and imparting no relief. We'll bring this to a close. Let us pray. Oh Lord, you have taught us that in all of our doings, without charity, we are nothing. Send forth the strength. Give us the strength of the Holy Ghost and excite and animate our hearts with the gift of charity, the very bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whosoever liveth is counted as worthless and dead before thee. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost.